this video I want to talk about two things that maybe don't seem super related. One is water. Water is an important topic for basically all of biology. So I just want to look at a little bit about how the atoms are arranged and how water molecules are attracted to each other because there's concepts in there that I'm going to talk about in all kinds of other videos. And then the other thing I want to talk about is macromolecules and how they're put together because in this section we're going to look at individual macromolecules, our nucleic acids and proteins, etc. And they all go together the same way, like they're made in the same way through a chemical process. And then they're broken down kind of in the same way and those processes involve water. Okay, so I've put those two topics together. How much of our bodies are made of water? Infants are about 75% water. And then as we get older, we have a little bit less total percentage of water. Males, healthy adult males are about 60%. And then females are a little bit less because they have a little bit more body fat. If an average healthy male is say, 12% body fat, an average healthy female might be, oops, 21% body fat, right? So females have a little bit less total body water. As we increase our body fat, then you have less water. So obese people can have as little as 45% water. As we age, our percentage of water will decrease, um, but we should remain fairly stable in the 55 to 60% water point for most of our adult lives. Now I wanna look at how much, like where is this water inside of our body? We have water inside of our cells and we have water in our blood, but we also have water in between our cells and that's called interstitial fluid. So we're just gonna look at our body composition, like our, our compartments of water. This diagram shows about how much water is inside the cells. Intracellular means inside the cell. Most of our water in our body is inside of the cells. Now this part is outside of the cells. Outside of the cells is extracellular. Extracellular means outside. So there's two places where body water can be outside of the cell. One, it can be in the blood. About 12% of all of the water in our body is found in the blood and about 21% is found in between cells. So interstitial fluid is in between cells. If you have too much interstitial fluid, then you have swelling. So that would be like edema. So maybe sometimes you'll notice maybe your fingers get swollen or your ankles get swollen. That's extra tissue or extra fluid in the interstitial space. Okay, so know that most of our body water is inside of our cells. Now let's look at how a water molecule is put together and what special sort of characteristics it has. We know that water is H2O. It has two hydrogens and one oxygen. An atom is composed of protons, which have a positive charge, neutrons, which are neutral, and that makes up the nucleus. And then around atoms are the electrons, and electrons have a negative charge. So protons are positive, electrons are negative, neutrons are neutral. So when we look at an oxygen atom, it has eight protons, eight neutrons, and eight electrons. When we look at the electron rings, two of them are on the inner ring, and six of them are on the outer ring. 
the outer ring is the most stable if it has eight in the outer ring. So if oxygen got two extra electrons or it shared two extra electrons, like sharing hydrogen's electron, then it would have a stable outer shell of eight electrons. So that's what happens. So oxygen will share electrons with hydrogen. When they are sharing electrons, they, it's called a covalent bond. Covalent bonds are very, very strong. These electrons are being shared between the hydrogen, which only has one proton, so each hydrogen is going to be stable with two because the inner ring likes to have two. So now hydrogen is stable and oxygen is stable. These covalent bonds are very, very strong. So you can't just pull these hydrogens off. So when we have water, we have water. The only way that we can change that is with, you know, very strong forces. When these atoms share electrons, they share them in a slightly different way because oxygen has eight protons, so it has eight positive charges. That means the negative electrons are going to be a little bit more attracted to the oxygen. That is going to give oxygen this partial charge. We use this symbol delta negative to show that it is not an ion. It's not a full charge. It's a partial negative charge. And because the electrons are closer to the oxygen, that means they're further from the hydrogen. So that makes hydrogen have a slightly positive charge. This makes our water have the slightly negative and slightly positive charges, and we call that being polar. When a molecule has fully lost an electron, it will become a positively charged ion, like sodium. If it fully gains an electron, like chloride, then it will be a fully negative chloride ion. But when you have covalent bonds and the electrons are not fully gained or lost, they're just shared a little unequally, then we call them polar. Okay, so water being polar is very important to how our cells function, how our body functions, how our physiology functions. Polar molecules are hydrophilic. Hydro means water and philic means like or love. So polar molecules love water. One example would be sugar. We talked about, or we will talk about sugar in one of the videos coming up. Sugar is a polar molecule. If you put sugar in your cup of tea, let's make a coffee cup here, and you add sugar, what's gonna happen when you stir it? It's going to dissolve. It will mix in water. Things that are hydrophilic will mix in water. Also charged molecules like salt. So salt is sodium and chloride. They are sodium ions and chloride ions. These are fully charged molecules. They are also hydrophilic. If you mix salt into a pot of water, it will also mix. So anything that mixes well in water is considered hydrophilic. Whereas nonpolar molecules do not like water. So hydrophobic means water fearing. Can you think of an example of some kind of a molecule or substance that does not like water? What would not mix in water? When we look at fats or oils, they are composed of carbon chains and they have hydrogens on them. But these covalent bonds, they, the electrons are shared equally. So there is no polar charge. These 
do not have a slightly positive and slightly negative charge. They are fully non-charged, so they are hydrophobic. When we put a bunch of water molecules together, here is an individual water molecule. Slightly positive hydrogens, slightly negative oxygen, and then when you mix a bunch of water molecules together, the opposite charges are going to be attracted to each other. So the slightly negative oxygens will be attracted to the slightly positive hydrogens. That forms this weak bond. This is just an attractive force and we call it a hydrogen bond. This is an important concept in biology because when we look at some of our macromolecules, like proteins for example, how they fold and make their secondary and tertiary structures is partly due to hydrogen bonding. So those sort of opposite charges are going to attract and it will make molecules come together. When we look at a water droplet, because of all of these hydrogen bonds, water likes itself. So water will form these cohesive little droplets. Now, let's go back to our table salt. Table salt is sodium chloride. Table salt, these atoms are only hanging out together because they have opposite charges. The sodiums are positively charged ions and the chlorides are negatively charged ions because this chloride gained one electron, that is a negative charge, and the sodium has lost one electron. So when you lose a negative charge, you become positive. When you gain a negative charge, you become negative. When we mix these together, the polar water molecules, so water is polar, and the table salt, these are charged. So the negatively charged chlorides are going to be attracted to the positively charged hydrogens. And the positively charged sodiums are going to be attracted to the negatively charged oxygens. When you mix salt in water, you're affecting how those water molecules are oriented. So I have a question for you. Is this a fact or a myth? If you put salt in a pot of water, does it boil faster than a pot of plain water? What about putting salt on ice? Does that have any effect? What do you think? Yes, it is true. When you put salt in water, you are disrupting the water molecules. So you are making those water molecules farther apart. The only difference between liquid water and vapor water is how far apart the molecules are. So when you put salt in your water, it is pushing the water molecules slightly further away from each other. So yes, the water will boil faster. And yes, that is why we put salt on icy roads. Right, so the difference between solid water, which is ice, and liquid water is how far apart the atoms are. So in ice, uh, well, water is a slightly weird thing because there's a density, but just, you know, in general, <laughs> when you put salt on ice, it is going to make it melt. So yes, those things are true. Now, the last thing that I wanna talk about is how we put together macromolecules and how we break them apart. There are four types of macromolecules that we're going to look at and how they're all put together is basically the same for each type. So the four macromolecules are proteins, nucleic acids, carbohydrates, and fats. And they are all made of building blocks. Proteins are made up of amino acids, Nucleotides make up our nucleic acids, which is our DNA and RNA. We have carbohydrates, and they are made up of sugars called monosaccharides. And then our lipids, our fats, are composed of glycerol and fatty acids. So when we put these all together, I'm gonna to use amino acids as an example. 
Here, we have two examples of amino acids. Okay, so let's just suppose we've got a glycine and an alanine. All amino acids have an amino group and a carboxyl group. And this next amino acid has an amino group and a carboxyl group. When we put these amino acids together, we're going to take the hydroxyl group, or the OH, oxygen and hydrogen, from one of the amino acids and combine it with the hydrogen from the other amino acid. When these two things come together, they form a water molecule. Now, follow this bond here. And over here, we now have a dipeptide. So here's the carbon and that bond. Here's the carbon and this bond. So now we've removed the OH and the H. This is called dehydration synthesis because we are losing a water molecule. And then we form this bond. This is a covalent bond. Now this carbon and this nitrogen are sharing electrons. And this will continue over and over and over as we put amino acids together to make a protein. Dehydration synthesis is losing water to form covalent bonds. And then lastly, we can break macromolecules down. So let's suppose you eat a piece of chicken that is made of protein and now it's in your stomach and you gotta start digesting it. We have to take those proteins and break them up into individual amino acids. So how do we do that? When we have two amino acids put together, here is our covalent bond in proteins. It's called a peptide bond, by the way. So we have our peptide bond here in between our two amino acids. Now we need enzymes. Remember that enzymes catalyze chemical reactions. This process, as well as dehydration synthesis, that can't happen without enzymes. Enzymes that specifically break down proteins, like peptidases or trypsin. We have a bunch of different enzymes that break down proteins. So then the reverse is going to happen. Hydrolysis, lysis means to break, and hydro means water. So hydrolysis is the process where now we're going to add water. When we add water, we're putting the OH group onto one amino acid, the hydrogen onto the other amino acid, and that breaks that covalent bond. So it's important to know how we make macromolecules and how we break them down. You need chemical um, enzymes, protein enzymes, for those reactions to occur.